NATO is brain dead, Emmanuel Macron declared more than two years ago. As Russia's Ukraine offensive enters its second month, he's calling once again for the European Union to create its own independent defence force. Is it just a pipe dream or will Russia's aggression finally galvanise Europe to stand on its own feet? Emmanuel Macron's handling of the Ukraine crisis has given him an unprecedented surge in support ahead of the first round of French presidential elections this weekend. But Macron hopes to transform his prominent role in diplomatic efforts into remaking the European Union's defence. Earlier this month in Versailles, the European Union discussed plans for spending $2 trillion on defence and energy without providing specifics. Germany has taken the historical step of spending 100 billion euros on modernizing its army, and it's finally planning to meet its NATO commitment of spending 2% of GDP on defense. For its part, France spends 52 billion on its military and is seventh in the world in global firepower rankings, ahead of every other European country. So are Macron's hopes of Europe developing its own defence force finally about to become reality? Let's bring in our panel and find out. In Paris, we welcome back Emmanuel Dupuy, president of the Institute for European Perspective and Security. In Newcastle, in the UK, Ed Arnold, European Security Research Fellow at the Royal United Services Institute. And in Busan, South Korea, Ben Nemeth, Lecturer in Defence Studies, Education at King's College London. Gentlemen, welcome to the show. Uh, Emmanuel, let me start with you. Um, just how far has Russia's invasion of Ukraine galvanised Macron's desire for a, a coordinated EU defence strategy? Well, it has confirmed the will of the French president to foster the uh, strategic compass, which has been presented and voted a few days ago in the EU uh, Minister of Defence uh, uh, meeting in Brussels. But of course, uh, there has been a before 24th of February and an after 24th February in uh, the robustness and the legitimacy of having a stronger and more robust CSDP, Common Security and Defence Policy, which has always been what Emmanuel Macron and, by the way, what uh, almost each president has been advocating for, at least since the uh, Solana document in 2003. Now, the issue is a bit quite, is a bit different. It's based on the fact that we need not only wording, but we need action. And this is something that the French, Emmanuel, French President Emmanuel Macron has always been saying. Uh, it's, uh, we are very happy that a certain number of our partners will go for the 2% GDP. We're very happy that Germany will uh, dedicate 100 billion of dollars of, of euros sorry for its defense policy. But again, we're a bit uh, annoyed because we have heard that uh, um, certain of our European partners are willing to uh, have a European will uh, for a common security and defence policy, but not with European uh, procurement uh, and European armament, which is, of course, a bit of a contradiction. We'll talk about the practicalities in just a moment, but uh, Ed, I wanted to ask you about Macron's views on NATO, because uh, a couple of years ago he described it as, as brain dead. Now, Recently, he says he stands by that opinion, but what did he mean? Does he mean he doesn't trust the US to guide defence policy? Well, uh, I think Macron's also always harshly misquoted, actually. What he said is um, that what we are currently experiencing is the brain death of NATO, which is possibly semantics, but I took that to mean it was a very specific dig at President Trump at the time and what he had been uh, signalling about the US commitment to NATO. Um, but also it was more about the conceptual development of NATO and where it's going, and that was more broadly a um, point at the US, but also the UK, who does a lot of conceptual development uh, within NATO. Uh, it's staying it stands by this claim. I mean, obviously, the uh, withdrawal from Afghanistan was also a big point in terms of Macron's view, and it uh, allowed him to try and forge and push ahead with the EU to have this new um, 5,000 strong rapid uh, reaction force. Um, but ultimately, um, I think, you know, French is, or the French are, and Macron as well, they are a difficult partner within uh, NATO, but they are still a very valuable partner. Um, and we'll have to see how this materialises 
uh, over the, this year because we're still only sort of six weeks into um, a crisis which has massive implications for European security as a whole. Yes, indeed. Uh, Bence, just building on, on um, what Ed's been saying, I, I mean, it, it does seem clear, doesn't it, that Macron believes NATO is not the answer to Europe's security concerns, but that there's no suggestion that he wants to pull France out of NATO. Yes, absolutely. So in the French uh, presidential debates, we can see that several candidates, actually three of five, are contemplating to pull out of NATO if they win. But it seems that Emmanuel Macron has the biggest chance to win the presidential election and he doesn't have an intention to pull out of NATO. Uh, it is the calculus of, of NATO and the European security structures might change if he doesn't win the election. And we know that there is a, there is a precedent that uh, France pulled out from the military side, military wing of NATO in 1966. And, uh, and it represented for many that uh, France became more independent and uh, from, NATO, from, from NATO and also from the US and could pursue a more sovereign foreign and defense policy. So it is in the mind of, of many uh, and several uh, presidential candidates in, in, in France, but uh, Macron doesn't have an intention to pull out of NATO. Uh, France, um, especially the defense policy community and also the foreign policy elite knows the value of NATO uh, and they are absolutely clear that they don't want to pull out of it. Uh, let's just, um, can I, can I, can I yes, go ahead, that? Emmanuel. Well, of course, um, my colleague is saying that three of the five candidates, well, there is 12 candidates, but uh, none is willing to pull out of NATO. Je, uh, Marine Le Pen, the extreme right candidate, said a few hours ago that she has no intention of withdrawing from NATO. And to be more precise, it's not withdrawing of NATO, it's withdraw eventually withdrawing of the military command of NATO. It, 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 this is right, quite true. In 1966, we, know, uh, we went out of the military command, which we came back in, which we came back in September 2009 with the uh, strasbourg kell uh, summit with President Sarkozy. Uh, and of course, none of the candidates are willing to pull out of the military command, but some candidates are arguing the fact that the money were, that we're putting into NATO, more or less $900 million uh, euro a year, uh, should be put in a more robust common security defense policy initiative uh, d'intervention uh, rapide. Well, let's let's talk more about the mechanics of this uh, this EU-wide defense strategy that Macron uh, favors. Macron says Europe has to become more independent of NATO. Here's what he said in a TV address recently. We cannot depend on others to defend us, whether on land, at sea, under the sea, in the air in space or in cyberspace. In this respect, our European defense must take a new step forward. Ed, let me come to you. You uh, mentioned the rapid deployment capacity. Uh, this is the 5,000 EU troops, uh, which EU members uh, hope will be available by 2025. Now, this is hoped that this will allow the EU to act without relying on NATO. What, what do you think about that strategy? That's a, that's a strategic compass plan. Yes, yeah, so that's sort of the headline capability uh, announcement uh, within the strategic compass. And it's, um, although there is a long lineage of uh, the EU um, trying to arrange rapid reaction forces, most notably the battle group concept from 2007, which famously has, has never taken the decision to actually deploy them. Um, that was in direct relation to what happened within Afghanistan and the need to have this capability where it could act independently from the US. So is this, um, sorry, however, just so I, I get this clear, is this the, the, the precursor to the much vaunted EU army, which uh, some member states have been talking about? No, so this is a rapid reaction force that can be used for things like non-combatant evacuation or um, it was actually worth noting that it was initially talked as about an initial entry force, which suggests that it would also be potentially used to for operations where there'd be an ongoing commitment. So actually, the first thing to notice that it's it's not a force of 5,000, it's actually a minimum force of 15,000, because you need troops that are deployable, ready to um, deploy, and then also on rest. So it's quite a big commitment for the EU, with uh, especially given their track record of deployments. And it's not necessarily 
the commitment in terms of the numbers or the capabilities that they have, although you know a lot of EU missions are supported also by US uh, assets. It's also actually about the decision to deploy. So unanimity is required to deploy that force, and that's what held the battle group's concept back. So actually what is needed is a more political process as well to look at Article 44 of the Treaty of the European Union, which would allow coalitions of the willing within a new EU framework to deploy. Uh, ben, we know that EU leaders met in Versailles recently. They pledged to boost their defence capabilities. Does that mean that they share Macron's view on a joint EU defence policy? Not necessarily. So the um, spending more on defence uh, has been uh, an issue for basically decades in Europe, and uh, and this debate started to become more and more stark after the the uh, Ukraine crisis in 2014, when uh, Russia occupied Crimea. So it is a it is a continuous process that uh, that uh, European countries started to more started to pledge more and more on on, on their defense budget, but definitely the the current war in Ukraine uh, has increased and 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 triggered a new dynamic in this regard. So it it doesn't necessarily that they share Macron's vision, but partially it it comes from U.S. pressure. Uh, and also from the from the different geopolitical situation that we are facing now, uh, of course, some European leaders share uh, uh, Emmanuel Macron's vision about uh, building more European Union capacities, but others are very uh, Atlanticist, so they are preferring NATO uh, as the main uh, architect and structure for guaranteeing European security and defence. And as, as we could see that even Germany, uh, who is also pro-European and also pro-transatlantic, recently decided to procure F-35 American fighter jets and not, and not European ones. So what we can see that, interestingly, both NATO and EU started to be strengthening its own commitments. And, uh, and we cannot see if EU cannot or not uh, became more relevant uh, and, and what will happen uh, with EU processes in the shadow of NATO. Uh, Emmanuel, do you agree? Uh, are some member states more inclined to see uh, NATO uh, as being better responsible for security or, or is there a, a growing desire for a, an EU defence policy that, as Macron sees it? Well, first, you have to assess that all the states do not have the same history, do not have the same geography, but uh, 22 of the European Union states belong to NATO. And therefore, there is a discussion, an ongoing discussion, a permanent discussion, whether or not it is better to say that we can assess the defense of our uh, European territory, whether it's the eastern flank, whether it's the southern flank, inside NATO or without implying NATO capability. And this is the important point. Uh, it's not important whether or not you have a 2% GDP for defense. It's what you take of it. And of course, if you use this 2% GDP to buy F35, F35 instead of putting that money into the uh, uh, infantry call it well, SCAF, System de Combat d'Avion du Futur, which would be in English, the future uh, air combat system or the main ground combat system, the tank of the future or the next generation artillery. And if you buy uh, um, American made material, of course, this is a problem because uh, if we are to vote a strategic compass to uh, um, ensure that we have a strategic vision till 2030, and if these materials, namely Patriot missiles, F-35, or other type of material, for example, uh, the, the fact that the Euro drone, the next generation drone, high, high altitude drone, will be driven by American um, 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 aircraft motors, it's very problematic uh, to take in that in consideration. As everyone knows, a combat system is reliable for at least 20, 30, or maybe 40 years. So strategic compass will not be automatically European if we are to use this money to buy other type of material than European-made material. 
Well, let, let's let's discuss what, how a European Defence Union would, would work in practice. Um, I, what is the advantage of being part of a, a European Defence Union? I, I guess on the face of it, it allows member states to pool national capabilities, and presumably that's beneficial, beneficial for, for members who have smaller defence capabilities. Uh, Ed, what, what's your view? What would be the benefit of an EU defence policy? Like Amala said earlier on, it's you know it, it's also a national view, so it's quite difficult to say of all of the European nations, um, you know, what what they necessarily will get out of it because there's you know there's so many factors at play here. I think the real issue is that from a territorial defence in terms of neutral defence position, that NATO is the ultimate guarantor of European security, and actually what we've seen in this crisis is you know, the the uh, US showing how much they are a, a, a European security actor. So, and they have the capabilities, they have mass, uh, and also they have key enablers, such as you know, intelligence, which is, which is really critical. So there's a camp within Europe who sort of see that the US is still a guarantor of the um, security. And then there's another camp led by Macron, which uh, believes that Europe should have its own uh, defence capability. I think it's worth noting at the moment that the concept of European strategic autonomy is, you know, there's a variety of definitions and part of uh, Macron's presidency for the six months of the EU Council was to define that. But it's actually taken a little bit more of a, it's not just about defence and security anymore because of what happened in Ukraine. It's more about energy security, sort of technology, technological autonomy, sort of supply chain security, food security. So it's actually taking a slightly a different view at the moment. So it's not just defence and security that he's speaking about now. You see, what, what I find difficult to understand is, is how member states would be happy to have centralised decisions involving military operations um, in, because uh, traditionally, you know, countries have sovereignty over where they send their own armies or which conflicts they choose to to enter. Uh, Bents, do you think there's a, a problem with? Do you think member states would be happy to hand those that responsibility and those decisions to to Brussels? So, in many ways, NATO has a capacity if and when uh, NATO members agree that we are going to an operation. Uh, NATO has the capacity and the infrastructure and the command structure to do this. So there are almost around eight, 9,000 people who work in NATO in different uh, military headquarters. And also there is a huge international staff in different agencies that support the NATO's work. And I think it is one of the difficulties that, um, that many NATO, NATO and EU member states do not want to duplicate these capacities because they are very expensive. And basically these structures have been built up for 70 years now, or more than 70 years, because the NATO was established in 1949. And, and the EU's de uh, security defense policy started to develop uh, 23 years ago. So it's, it's, there is a disparity in this regard, and, and there is an opportunity cost to, to duplicate this, uh, uh, not, not an opportunity cost, real cost to duplicate this, these capacities. So there is a kind of model uh, how to do this? We can do this central, in centralized way through NATO if there is a decision to be made to go to operations. Uh, but the EU lacks, uh, as, a, as, a, as an organization, lacks these capacities and oftentimes uses NATO capacities. So and I think it is one of the reasons that it is not only policy, but, but it is also creating uh, resources to build a more independent uh, European capability here. And in many ways, there are capabilities, military capabilities, especially in terms of enablers, that the Europeans still lack and they're relying on, on US uh, military capabilities in this regard. However, what I think that what the, this crisis in Ukraine showed that whatever uh, happened, um, in many ways, the EU's defense wing started to be much more stronger, and especially in terms of providing military aid to different uh, uh, areas and also um, uh, creating um, uh, with the sanctions a much ro more robust uh, 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 response to many ways. Mm -hmm. It shows that the EU as a, as, a, as a security actor will be much more relevant in the future. But uh, in my view, it will take time to decide if the EU will have the same structures and infrastructures and common structures as the NATO has, because as I mentioned, it, it, it has huge cost implications. Emmanuel, 
a, a lot of critics of the idea of an EU defence union say there's not really a need for it because the Ukraine crisis has shown that member states are quite capable of making very fast strategic decisions. They sent weaponry and military assistance to Ukraine when it needed it. You don't need a centralized decision-making body to, to do that. What do you see as the main benefit of an EU defense union? Well, first you have to assess that the 900 million of euros which have been proposed and uh, validated by Joseph Borrell are very needed for the Ukrainian forces, and this is a European centralized decision uh, inside the European Facility for Peace. And this is something which is, has been assessed as very positive. As you rightly mentioned, NATO, United uh, European Union, are organization made of states. So, of course, if you have a common uh, sense of why it's important to uh, reboost your defense policy inside the 27, inside the 22, or inside the 30, 22 European states among the 30 NATO states, then the final result is the same, is that you are deploying troops and you are deploying uh, needs and having capability for 1,000 NATO members, uh, NATO soldiers, which happen to be more, more, more or less uh, European Union uh, uh, soldiers, plus United States, Belgium and France in Roma or Romania, or, uh, for example, Canadian plus British uh, soldiers side by side inside the, uh, uh, be, um, the uh, air policy mission, the uh, links mission inside Estonia and the Baltic states. And, of course, it's the same thing as the troops are not NATO nor European Union. They are member states deployed inside capabilities, inside mission, the uh, high readiness force of NATO, as we are assuming the uh, uh, bat alert battalion commandment, and this is why we have deployed 500 French soldiers in Romania and 200 more in Estonia. So the question is, a strategic compass is useful if there are strategic compass in, inside each of its the member states of European Union and NATO. So you have to have the same convergency on the importance to have a hard policy and not only a soft policy when it comes to tackle the question, the, the integration of a certain number of states inside or near the, um, the inside our neighborhood. Uh, and of course, this is an essential change or cap uh, between before the 24th and after the 24th is that everyone assumes the fact that we have to have a more stronger defense capability and not only have a sort of diplomatic tool uh, which we are reluctant to use, and this was said before with my uh, colleagues from Great Britain, we did not use the uh, uh, first entry force in Sahel in 2013. We did not use it in 2011 in Libya. Uh, we went in uh, Sahel on our own. We went and participated in the Armatan mission in uh, 2011 under NATO umbrella. So let me ask, um, as we come to the end of the discussion, whether we think Macron's vision of a Europe-wide defence strategy is any closer to reality. Ed, what are your thoughts? No, I, I don't think it is. But I, I suppose at the moment, even you know, taking the Ukraine war out of this for a moment, I mean, Charles Michel last December said that yeah, 2022 was the year of European defence. He was absolutely right, but for the wrong reasons. And we actually had a year whereby the EU and NATO were both conceptually developing at the same time, which is unusual, and both out to 2030. So with the EU strategic compass that we've discussed, but also NATO's new strategic concept, which will be unveiled at the summit in Madrid at the end of June. So really, I think there's a couple of issues here that first, the European nations or your Atlantic nations have to deal with the immediate issues surrounding Ukraine, but also they then need to really rebuild and sort of say, well, you know, sort out the duplication issues that have been around since the end of the Cold War. I mean, this is a real golden opportunity to sort that out. And I think the difficulty for Macron at the moment is that NATO is, in a way, had a, a shot in the arm because of Ukraine. This is back to core sort of Washington Treaty, uh, mutual defence, Article 5 territories. And Macron always had a difficult position because it was his view 
but he needed to convince other European nations, especially the nations in the East. But actually, the nations in the East now are saying, well, we've been talking about the threat from Russia for a long time now, and it's here. Uh, Putin's actions has really shown the risk that Russia has conventionally nuclear and also sub-threshold. So he then has to try and, um, you know, have dialogue with the uh, Eastern European nations and try and change their mind. I think that's going to be very difficult. But the EU can do some other things, such as crisis management operations, mainly focused on Africa, which is historically where a lot of CSDP missions have been. And actually, I think the appetite from a NATO position for out of area operations is not there because of what happened in Afghanistan after 20 years of effort. So there's things that the EU can do, but I just don't think mutual defence is one of them. Gentlemen, we're going to have to leave it there. I know this is something that we could talk about for uh, a lot longer. Thank you very much indeed for joining me. Emmanuel Dupuy, Benson Nemeth and Ed Arnold. Thank you. And remember, you can see more discussion and debate on our YouTube channel. Search for Roundtable TRT World for now from me and all the team here. Bye-bye. Thanks for watching.